Okay, welcome everybody to Speaking and Listening in Art Museums, Addressing the Common Core State Standards for English Language Arts. We are really excited to host um, what will be the, for the Met, the, our first hangout um, for K-12 through educators. And I'd like to take a moment um, to, for everybody to just introduce themselves. We've got a combination of both museum educators and active K-12 through teachers. Um, so let's start with Angela. Um, if you want to just say a quick hello um, to everybody. Hi, I'm Angela Fremont from PS69. I teach K through five. I'm an art teacher, and um, I teach 900 mostly Asian students. <laughs> wow, that, that is a big number. That just made things very real, Angela. <laughs> so I'm gonna um, hand over to Claire. Everything Claire, just, you just say a quick up. hello. Okay, I'm Claire Hagen, and I teach at DUI Clinton High School. I work with 12th graders. I am a humanities teacher. Thanks, Claire. Um, next up, we have Kelly. Um, hi, I'm Kelly. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, and I teach at PS 154 in Brooklyn, pre-K through fifth grade, art teacher. Thanks, Kelly. We will turn it over to Michael. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Bollier, and I teach in Boston at the Kennedy Academy for Health Careers. Um, and I teach English language arts, and I teach about 110 ninth graders. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Egan. I'm the school partnership educator at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. And I work with Michael as well as about 45 other teachers and about 1,600 pre-K through 12th grade students. Great. Thanks, Sarah. And then we have Veronica. Um, hi, I'm Veronica Alvarez. I'm the education specialist for teacher audiences at the J. Paul Getty Museum. So I oversee teacher programs at the Getty Center and Villa, which includes professional development, um, online curricula, and so forth. And my name is Claire Moore. I work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and very excited to be with you um, today. I'm going to take a moment just to give you a brief overview of our session so you'll know what to expect during the course of our time <coughs> together. So um, we just had a quick introductions um, and we're moving into the overview. Essentially, today we'll be thinking about ways experiences with works of art can support the Common Core State Standards for English Language Arts and really um, exploring hands-on strategies, thinking about what this might look like in practice. We'll have um, three different activities during the course of our hour together, um, one organized by each um, participating institution, and then we'll have an opportunity um, for reflection and to answer question and answer questions you may have during the session um, before wrapping up. Um, so I'm going to pull up um, on your screen. Um, you're welcome to ask questions and throughout the session. You can do that on the event page if you're watching this live. Um, feel free to just type in your questions and we will see them. And you can also um, vote questions. So if someone asks a question that you're really interested in hearing about, you can just click on that question to vote it up and um, we'll address those that are kind of the highest priorities there at the end. So I thought we'd take a moment um, just to take a look at these anchor standards for speaking and listening from the Common Core. Um, and we will see a range of approaches um, during the course of our time together. So exploring ways different institutions and different experiences with works of art can really engage students in a range of com conversations and collaborations, um, support evidence-based reasoning through close looking and discussion. So we'll really find a range of entry points um, to the topic today. And I just wanted to mention at the start that we will provide a um, link to the PowerPoint um, presentation we're using for the session today at the end so you can go back and reference any of those materials. So we will dive right in. I believe Michael um, is up. 
So Michael, feel free to take it away when you're ready. Okay, so I'm actually going to introduce a little bit what we're going to do together. So the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum uses visual thinking strategies, or VTS, in our partnership programs. And VTS is a method about, which involves open-ended group discussions about artwork. So when students come to the museum or even in their own classes with their classroom teachers, they talk about a diverse range of artworks and they build critical thinking and communication skills. So the teacher structures and facilitates whole class, student-driven discussions, the way that Michael's about to do with you all. And they paraphrase every student's comment, they ask open-ended questions, and they really encourage their students to look deeply to use evidentiary reasoning and to really articulate their ideas clearly. Students are responsible in these discussions for contributing all of their observations and interpretations and providing evidence from the artwork to support their ideas. They learn new ways to state their thoughts by listening to each other and to the teacher's paraphrases. And they're constantly reevaluating and building on each other's ideas to revise their own thinking when they're taking in other people's perspectives. Um, and we use art for this because art is uniquely suited for these types of discussions. It's authentically open-ended. It doesn't have just one right answer. It's got lots and lots of right answers. And using visual art as a text both fulfills the Common Core's standard for using a diverse array of media, but it also acts as a concrete point of reference during the discussion. So the students can always turn back to look at the same thing, that they're all seeing the same thing. They're all on the same page. Um, so we use age-appropriate images. And the students are motivated, they're excited, they really want to get their ideas out and be heard. So it helps even the shyer students have opportunities to express themselves in this really sort of safe way. Um, and we found in our research that these students actually do internalize the skills and they show up later on in writing and also in individual um, oral performance. So usually VTS is about 20 minutes long a discussion about one artwork lasting about 20 minutes. So we're going to do a brief little taste, and I'll let Michael show you what a VTS discussion might look like with one of the most beloved artworks from the Gardner Museum. So take it away, Michael. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so we're going to look at this image right now, and what I'd like you all to do is just look at it, take it in, look all over the image, take in the details, um, and then after you've had some time to look at it, I'm going to ask you what you think is uh, going on in this image. And for those of you watching live, I encourage you to add your responses either to the artwork or to the process itself in the Q&A, and we can talk about that afterwards. Wow. All right, so now that we've had time to look at the image, I'm going to open up for discussion. And um, do me a favor, and if you have something to say, just raise a hand just so I know uh, kind of the order in which I'm going to call on people. Um, and you're answering the question, what do you think is going on in this picture? Okay. All right, thank you. Veronica? Um, it looks like a woman is dancing. Okay, thank you very much. So you're seeing a woman dancing, and what do you see that makes you think that there's a woman dancing? Um, her body posture, and then the fact that there's musicians behind her. Great. So you're looking at the kind of body arched um, backward um, of the woman in the front, and you're looking at the musicians in, in the background, um, and that kind of signifies to you that this probably is a, a woman dancing. Thank you. What more can we find? All right. Um, Thank you, Angela. Yeah, Angela, what um, do you think is going on? It seems like it's a performance because of the lighting and because of the way the background is, the people are dressed in a kind of fancy and um, uniform way. Thank you. So we're looking at the, the kind of illumination going on in the image and also looking at the people in the background and noticing um, the garments that they're wearing and they seem to be, to be wearing uniform garments, um, all kind of the same. Um, thank you very much. What more can we find? Um, yes. 
It looks Hi, like Kelly. Oh, thank you, Kelly. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm Kelly. Sorry. Um, it looks like it's a flamenco performance because it's guitar and just the the way the woman is doing that sort of Spanish posture, and it looks like there's clapping going on and there's guitars hanging on the wall. So it looks it looks Spanish flamenco to me. Thank you. So. We're looking at the atmosphere of the image and noticing the guitars on the wall, um, also noticing the, the posture of the woman in the forefront, as mentioned before, and thinking that it could be flamenco dancing, um, which is a Spanish dance. Um, what, about, what about the way that the figure is dancing suggests to you that it's flamenco? Um, she might have castanets in her hand or something. Um. It look it, it it looks like she has um it looks like she might be doing castanets as she dances. Um. Thank you. So so looking at looking at the figure's hands and seeing um way to believe to be uh, castanets and, and thinking that castanets are a musical instrument often used with, with flamenco dancing. Thank you. What more can we find? Well, she's very beautiful. Oh, I'm supposed to raise my hand. Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Um, yes, Kelly. And and what do you see that make, makes you think that she has beautiful characteristics? That was Angela. Oh, I'm sorry, Angela. That's okay. Um, her, she's so graceful. And what about her makes you think that she's graceful? The curve of her arms. The, and the length of her neck, the openness of her uh, of her face and shoulders. Thank you. So taking a look at at the the arc in her arms and how they kind of be stretched outward, and looking at um, her long graceful neck and the way that her shoulders are kind of relaxed and rolling back, um, make you think that she seems to be beautiful. That she has exquisite characteristics. Um, and that she has a very graceful um, essence about her. So graceful. Thank you very much, Angela. Um, what more can we find? Yes, yeah, Sarah. I respectfully disagree. To me, her arm is twisted in a way that I've tried to do many times, and it's very uncomfortable to hold, and she's sort of leaning back precariously. And her face also, Angela, you were saying that the face seems sort of exquisite. To me, it's a little bit more broad, not quite as refined. Mm -hmm. So I, I see it sort of an opposite way, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so Sarah's seeing um, kind of a contrast from, from Angela's comments and, and noticing that the kind of the, the way that her arm is positioned seems more awkward, more contorted, um, in that her facial features aren't exquisite, but rather um, more non-distinct um, <coughs> to Sarah. Um, thank you. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more, two more comments, and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, thank you. Claire? What I'm noticing is, has to do with the setting. Um, it looks like it's in an indoor space, but it doesn't remind me of a theater, the way that I would think with an audience and a stage. Um, so I'm thinking that it's some kind of community space, an indoor place where people gather from the community. Mm -hmm. And what do you see that makes you think it's more of a community space and less uh, like a theater? Because of the wall in the background, there's no curtain, um, and the musicians are lined up right against the wall. We see the guitars on the wall. There is light shining on the dancer, so there's some kind of light source but it's not uh, the kind of light that I would imagine being on a stage. Thank you. So, so Claire's noticing that uh, the, the wall in the background is, is lacking a curtain and associating curtains with, you know, for performance yeah, spaces. So thinking that it's more of a community room or a community center, um, and also noticing that there is a light source, so um, there is some type of, of performance-based um, light going on here, but it's definitely not um, a typical performance space. Uh, and, you know, just thinking about kind of the spatial orientation of the room. Thank you. 
uh, for bringing us to sight and clear. Um, and let's have one last comment. Who haven't we heard from yet? Yes, Veronica. Um, I'm just really struck by the shadows. Um, they just give this heightened sense of drama because you know, like, like be, behind her is a dark shadow, but then her face is so lit up from the side, and then you almost miss the people in the back, but there seems to be other dancers to the right of it, because, and then very, just very strong shadows all around, and so it really makes her dress and the fabric just kind of highlights it dramatically. So it's, it almost gives, like what Sarah was saying in terms of her face, it almost gives her a sinister look, and yet... Um, so dramatic as well. Thank you, Veronica. Um, Veronica, what do you see that makes you think that there are other dancers um, in this image? Well, to the right of her, it seems like there's these women, and they're just like overly dramatic to be just observing, you know, um, especially like the woman in red with her hand raised high, and mm -hmm. the woman next to her. It's just like these over dramatic poses and so forth. Thank you. So, so Veronica is really drawn to the shadows uh, in the image and noticing how the shadows uh, illuminate, especially the, the figure in the forefront, the dancer, um, her dress. But then also noticing to the right of the figure, uh, there seem to be other dancers who, in Veronica's opinion, are paying less of a passive role and more of an active role um, because they seem to be really animated, um, showing a lot of activity um, on the right. Well, I, I want to thank everyone for all of your contributions. All of your insights and your observations were really detailed. You gave excellent evidence to show why you thought what you were thinking and how you saw what you were seeing. Um, so I thank you for sharing all of your thoughts and contributing to our understanding of this image. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. That was great. And thank you to all of the rest of you for participating. And I hope that you can see that if this conversation was to go on a little bit longer, we would really build up a group understanding of what this picture was all about. Um, so VTS, or Visual Thinking Strategies, is prioritizing that experience of the group creating an interpretation or an understanding. We're not really focusing on the art historical information, but more about that group dynamic, the communication, the listening, the speaking, and the critical thinking. So hopefully at the end we'll have a little more time to hear more from Michael about how this type of teaching fits into his classroom. But for now, I think we'll um, pass it along to Veronica. And I think that actually, if you go to the next slide, sorry, Claire, if you go to the next slide, you can just see some resources if you want to learn more about visual thinking strategies, how we use it at the Gardener, or to contact me for more information. But thanks again. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. So, Veronica, I'll put you on camera for a bit and we'll just let you know when you're ready for your slides. Oh, can, well, I have, can I have the resource page back, please? Oh, sure. So back one slide. Thank you. That was too fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, you can always come back to the PowerPoint and to the Hangout to look um, closely at okay. all of these slides. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. Thanks for that reminder, Sarah. Um, so I'll go ahead and put Veronica on. And Veronica, just let me know when you'd like to um, turn over to your first slide. Oh, that's fine now. It's, it's on the first slide. Um, hi, as I mentioned, I'm Veronica from the j Getty Museum. And the activity that I wanted to share with you is um, a, um, something that we adapted from Project Zero and a, the, um, from the education, um, from the school, the Graduate School of Education, sorry, from Harvard. And um, they have See, Think, Wonder. And we've kind of adapted um, it to um, see, wonder, think, um, and it's really designed to foster inquiry-based learning to give students time to make careful observations. So it has some similarities with BTS, um, as you guys just saw now, um, and it is to encourage curiosity and thoughtful interpretation um, and close looking, but it very much based on visual evidence. And I wanted to share that with you because I thought it was very key and aligned to the common core in looking, especially when looking at text and making um, uh, inferences based on textual evidence that students are reading. And we thought it would be a good um, 
adaptation, adaptation with works of art. So ours um, gives students an opportunity to post questions. So the way, as I mentioned, it used to be see, think, wonder. And we did see, wonder, think, because we really wanted to give students the opportunity to post questions immediately after they spend some time looking. So I'll do something similar. And if you guys want to, again, raise your hands. Um, uh, to look at this work of art. And what I really like about this activity is that it could be used with uh, countless works of art. And what you're looking at is an ancient work of art. Um, so I wanted to be able to use a three-dimensional sculpture and do that adaptation. So what do you guys see in this image or in this work of art, <laughs> an image of a work of art? Um, I'm sorry, I can't see your name. I think Is it Daniela? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Daniela. Welcome. Sorry I'm late. We have a blizzard here. Um, <laughs> so I see three figures, and uh, it looks as though the one on the left is thinking, which I kind of um, am guessing from her hand gesture. Um, and then a center figure who seems to be pointing to something, and then a figure on the right who looks to me like they're explaining something. OK. Um, so based on their postures, you're thinking of doing that. Um, so when we use this strategy, I, just a caveat, I normally would have asked students, especially if I'm in, a work, in front of a, the work of art or in the classroom, to pair share. Um, so I would ask you know, to, for pairs to just share with each other what they're seeing and to kind of put off a little bit of making inferences and just looking at the object and saying what they see. And so Daniela, you just said, you know, she based on their poses, you think she's thinking and the other one and so forth. Um, and I thought that that would be very critical in terms of um, the common core about listening and speaking because after people had an opportunity to share what they see, they would then, I would invite um, students to have them share what their partner said so that you are noticing whether they are listening and thus able to articulate what their partner said about them. Okay. So, um, OK. So I'm sorry I should have started with that caveat. But any other observations of what you see in this work of art? Um, yes. yes. I'm sorry, I can't see the names very well. Angela. Thank you. Um, well, I'm sitting here drawing as okay. we're doing this and I have seen because I'm drawing that two of the figures have birds legs and bird claw feet. Yes. I did not see that when I first looked. Oh I'm glad. So you made this observation here. If you guys look closely these women are very unique because the, the bird legs on the lower part. Any other observations? It's kind of creepy. <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> um, um, Sarah, I think you had your hand up. So I'm noticing that they're overall mostly a mottled gray-brown color, but some portions, like the figure, um, the figure on the left, the sort of arm, and then the figure on the right, the face, are a little bit lighter, more white. But then the figure on, in that's seated in the middle, the chair and the ottoman are a little bit more golden. So there are those slight variations of color. Yes, exactly. There's this detail here. Um, and that's what I um, love about ancient works of art, because most of the time people assume that they're white or colorless. You know, we don't, we're only used to seeing marble. But um, they were actually painted in antiquity. And, um, and then you said they look kind of grayish, and that's because they're made out of terracotta. And then so the gold, um, and you see the paint on there. Yeah. Um, so we noticed some observations and kind of had a discussion about those. Um, can we go to the next slide? Sure, coming right up. And what I'd like for you to do um, is, what would what do you wonder about? And again, I, if I was in a classroom or in front of the work of art, I would have had chair, um, students share. But um, what do you wonder about um, with these works of art? Yes, I'm sorry, you don't have your hand. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't. Kelly. 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 Yeah. Kelly. I'm, I'm wondering what the, the seated man is holding in his hands. Because um, I can see in his right hand he has something, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering. Okay. What. 
So you're wondering what is he holding? And, it, and obviously the images show um, too small to see. Um, somebody else had their hand. There was a lot of hands. When I actually went to wonder, I think all of your hands went up. <laughs> Claire, what are you wondering about? I wonder why all three of these objects are put together because I see they're not connected. So I wonder also if in their original context if they were all connected in some way. Hmm. Ooh. Oh, that's very interesting because they're all separate but they are put together. Um, Michael. Um, I'm wondering in terms of spatially why um, the two figure, the figure on the right and the figure on the left are both on these um, kind of pedestals and they're raised above and then the figure in the middle is already sitting down. So it's like the figure in the middle would have already been lower but then they also chose to add height to the figures on the left and to the right to sort of just to think if there's some kind of hierarchical um, difference going on. Yeah, I, I don't know. Okay, so based on the displays that the curator put them on, you're right. wondering about um, if, whether there might be a hierarchy in terms of the sculptures. Anybody else? Any under Sarah, what do you wonder about? I'm wondering about the title. It says Poet as Orpheus. Oh. So I'm wondering if that means the poet is taking on the role of being Orpheus, of being a character. And then if the oh. sirens are also roles. Oh, fascinating. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, if I was in the classroom, and then I was writing down as you guys were talking, I would probably have categorized the different um, categories of what you guys were discussing. You know, um, like what is happening. Um, I think Daniela initially was kind of, when you first looked at it, you, um, based on their posture and so forth, you started um, wondering what was happening, if someone was listening and so forth. Um, how it was made, we kind of didn't go there, but um, like I said, if I if it was a different format, I would have probably grouped your um, your questions in a separate category and see what was most interesting to most people. Um, but based, let's go. Could we go to the next slide? So just looking at the visual evidence that you see, are there any questions we could look at to answer some of your questions? Um, so what do you think? Um, why don't we go um, about uh, maybe about why are is there any visual evidence about um, one of your questions that you guys were wondering about perhaps about why they're grouped together is there anything looking at the statues or the hierarchy or the placement that help us answer some of those questions Um, yes, go ahead, Michael. Um, I, I think that the poet Orpheus, since he is sitting in the middle, that maybe there's some type of influence from the other two figures, the sirens. Maybe the sirens have some type of influence over, um, over Orpheus, since they're kind of you know, above him, and um, Orpheus is kind of more passive sitting in the middle. OK. Based on that. any other things that you think, based on what you were wondering? So I'm sorry. I think Kelly was asking what he's holding. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes, um, what what is uh, the major difference I think between BTS and this technique is that um, what we do believe in, especially because ancient works of art. If you do know the answer to a question, then we um, then we answer it for the students. So he's holding in his hand. Um, a sausage-like thing. It looks like a sausage, and that's how most kids um, um, say. And it's called a plectron. So what he's missing, and I don't, I mean, it's hard to tell on this image, but he would have had a kithra or a lyre, and so he would have been playing an instrument, uh -huh. which is why we think he might have been the poet Orpheus, because um, his father was a god, Apollo, um, in one version of the myth. And so he was playing a musical instrument. Um, that. And then, Michael, you had mentioned about the pedestals, and I'm not sure if you could tell, but if you look closely at the image, the um, the bird's legs are on this like rocky cliff, because according to the myth, the sirens were these creatures that were half women, half birds, um, and they lived on an island. 
Mm-hmm. And they would, um, and they sang so beautifully that when men would go by their on their ships through the island, they would lose themselves and crash against the ships um, and die <laughs> essentially. Um, so Orpheus was able to circumvent the sirens because he, like as I mentioned, in one version his father's a god Apollo, so he played so beautifully that the sirens stopped there singing which is what Daniela had mentioned. She's just listening, the woman on the left. And they were so entranced by Orpheus that they were able to circumvent. And, and he was part of Jason and the Argonauts, and so that's how they were able to circumvent the sirens. Okay. So sorry, I summed it up rather quickly because I think I'm running out of time. Um, but just to kind of um, conclude, um, when we do that, when we do answer some of the questions, and then we kind of put it back to the students, like, now that you know that information, is there anything else you wonder about, or is there anything else that strikes you about this artwork? Thank Any? you so much, Veronica. Um, and I want to just remind us, people who are viewing online, that you are welcome to add questions using the Q&A tool, and we'll see those. And you feel free to also just add comments as well um, to share ideas. Um, so I am going to share um, one strategy um, that we've been using in programs um, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But before, I wanted to just um, let our colleagues say a quick hello. We've had really um, wild weather here in New York City and on the East Coast in general, so I just want to let um, a couple of colleagues who've joined us say a quick hello. So, Daniela, I'm going to put you on screen just to say a quick hello and kind of share a little bit about where you're coming from and, um, and so forth. Sure. Um, so my name is Daniela Guerin. I teach seventh grade ancient history at the Cape Cod Lighthouse Charter School and uh, studied history and art history as an undergraduate. And so I, I make a lot, a big strong effort to always incorporate the visual arts into our study of whatever history it is that we're doing. So hello, Thanks. everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Daniela. And I'm gonna, Kelly, I'm going to put you on just for a minute so you can say a quick hello. Um, hello. Um, um, I'm Kelly Normand. I, I, uh, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. I teach in the public schools. My uh, background is as a painter, and, um, and, uh, but I've been teaching for eight years now. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks for joining us. In spite of the blizzard, we really appreciate it. <laughs> Great. Um, so I'm going to um, go ahead and move on to our last um, activity for, the, for today's session. And this is an activity really focusing on um, the emphasis on evidence-based reasoning and persuasive arguments um, that we see up here in many of the sections of the Common Core State Standards for English Language Arts. Um, it appears in the speaking and listening um, areas as well as some of the writing um, areas. So um, just to preface it with that. So we're actually going to have a mini debate. Um, this will be an express version. Um, I think like Sarah mentioned, the more um, you look, the more you see and things develop over time. But I wanted to give you a feel for um, what this might look like in practice. So I'm going to start by just orienting you to the um, museum to give you a sense if you've never been to the Metropolitan, um, to our collections and Veronica, sorry we didn't spend a lot of time on oh. your slide, but I will mention to everybody um, we are sharing the presentation. Did you want to say a quick word before I move forward? No, that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. So um, if you're watching online, know that we will provide right after the session a link to this document so you can go back and take a look. Um, so this is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We're located in New York City. The collection really spans from ancient um, to contemporary with works of art from around the world. Today um, we're going to focus on a um, work of American art from our modern collection. And I'd like you to start by just taking a moment to look closely and consider the artist's choices. Things like the use of color, um, the light within the scene, 
even the way the composition is organized. So just take a moment to kind of um, look closely at those elements. So we've had a little um, time to start looking closely. I'm going to share a little bit of information and um, then we'll dive right in. So this is a work by Charles Sheeler. It's from 1945 and the subject we have here, it's a hydroelectric power plant um, that was built. So really something generating power for the community. And some people really view this work as a celebration of innovations and in technology, while other people, um, specialists as well as just viewers in the gallery, really see this work as a critique. So I want to take some time to consider kind of both of those perspectives. And we're going to divide up here into two um, virtual teams um, to make a case for each side supported by visual evidence. So I'm going to ask um, Veronica, Claire, Claire H, um, Michael, and Daniela. I want you to really think for a moment about those elements of the artist's choices, color, light, composition, even the way the paint is applied um, as you look at this work and consider what things might you tie to really suggesting this is a celebration of all the great things technology and these innovations can bring. And I'm going to ask Sarah, Angela, and Kelly to really look closely at those same elements, but really to come up with a case for um, really viewing this work of art as a critique. So I'm going to give you a moment to think independently and then we will um, move forward and hear from, from both of the groups. So just take a moment to reconsider the work through that lens. All right, so what I'd like to do as a way to kind of um, facilitate the conversation in our express version of this activity is to ask the groups to each use this format. So we're going to take turns going back and forth between the groups. And so the first group will make um, a, a point supported by visual evidence. And then the second group is going to listen really closely and you're going to paraphrase what you heard. So something along the lines of it sounds like you're saying and then paraphrase what you heard. And then you can say but or however and then shift it to kind of a point that you're noticing about the work. This gets very animated in the galleries. I will, t <laughs> I will say that. Um, so let's start um, with the work as a celebration. Um, of technology, and feel free, anyone who has an idea to kick it off. It looks like Danielle is rearing to go, um, so Danielle, <laughs> feel free to share um, what you're noticing and, of course, support it with um, some of the details in the work. Sure. So, uh, in terms of it being a celebration, I'm looking at uh, something that looks like it can produce a giant capacity um, and so hydroelectricity this looks like it could serve lots and lots of people I don't have the dimensions of the painting but it seems to me just that it's this vast um, production model and I think um, if I were to compare it in my head to I believe it was uh, Monet's painting of the Gare Saint-Lazare, which is very dark and sort of ominous and, and a look at a train station and, and he seemed very anti-industrialist. This is much brighter, it's lighter, um, you can see shadows and so that tells me that there's light or sun. Um, so I think it's, it's showing this industrialization in a positive light. 
Okay, so thank you for kicking it off, Danielle. And I'll just fill in that piece of information you asked about the dimensions of this painting if you were in person. So it's around um, 24 inches high by just over 29 inches wide. Um, so just to add that layer, um, something you do miss in a digital reproduction. So I'm going to turn it over to the group that's, that's saying this is really a critique of industry. And again, I'd like you to paraphrase what you heard and then shift the conversation using thought or however to a point that you're noticing about the work. So I'll just look for a raised hand. Oh, Kelly, Kelly's ready. Yeah. Um, I mean, it seems like you were saying that this is monolithic and big and it could serve a lot of people. So that's a, uh, you know, a, an endorsement for industry. Um, but it's a painting without any people and without any live plants. It, it's, um, it's, um, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing growing or, or humanistic. Um, in, in the painting. Um, that's it. Okay, so um, our celebration group, um, again, you'll paraphrase what you heard and then add your point. Okay, Michael's going to add an idea. Um, so from Kelly, I, I believe I'm hearing that uh, it's really non-humanistic, there are no people, there are no plants. Um, and I hear that, but I, I think that going back to um, what Daniela was saying, you know, the, the focus of this image is really on the industrial power and the huge source of power that it's going to bring uh, to a community. And even if you look at how, how vast and, and how, how big it is really focusing on the structure, you can really see it as, as a powerhouse. And I don't think... Um, it's meant to be necessarily involving humans because it was obviously man-made and produced by humans. So I think the humanistic aspect is that. And so I think, you know, just looking at the image and, and looking at what it's about, it's about something that was man-made. So there's no need to include humans in this man-made uh, portrayal. Thanks, Michael. So let's take one more point um, from the group who's seeing this as a critique, and you'll want to, again, paraphrase what you heard and then add your idea. <laughs> Claire, you can go ahead. <laughs> I was going to uh, make an argument for the celebration of industrialization. Let's pause in, in the spirit of fairness um, to go critiquing a point, but I'm glad it, you're poised and ready to go. It's an intimidation <laughs> factor. <laughs> so so I can make a rebuttal um, that this massive scale that Michael was talking about and how people made this structure um, so you wouldn't necessarily need to see any human life or any living creatures because man is present there in the construction itself. But to me, the way that it's presented by the artist, the colors that are used, and even the color of the sky, and that sort of gray, monotonous, anonymous character of the beiges and grays and off-whites give it a negative cast to me. It reminds me, you know, it's not dark like the St. Lazar like Daniela was talking about, but it's reminding me of sort of Soviet era. Everyone looks the same. Everything's big and government controlled, and this to me seems like a critique of that. Thanks, Sarah. And so, Claire, we'll turn it to you to paraphrase what you heard and add your point. Sure. I just heard you um, talking about the color, maybe the monotonous, uh, the monotony of the color, and I'm thinking that that might not make a difference if we look at the image as a celebration, the way that it looks like a cathedral. Um, cathedrals being kind of one color or uh, an image of a ziggurat. Um, these cathedral-like structures that are reaching up into the sky um, in this kind of ethereal way. Um, uh, you know, the sky seems important, uh, so it seems uh, almost as if there's uh, kind of a transcendent quality that's uh, being depicted in the, in the image and the color. Uh, wouldn't matter so much with the uh, the background in mind that 
we see those monotonous colors in these other images like cathedrals, pyramids, ziggurats. <laughs> Wow, Claire. <laughs> um, I'm sorry to say we're going to have to pause there. Um, I think we brought in some people with some debate experience here. We had some really great points <laughs> on um, both sides. And often after we've gone back and forth several times, I take a poll at the end um, just to see um, did anyone have a change, like in heart, at the beginning you were assigned basically a point of view. It may or may not have been um, what you were thinking, but it's always interesting. There's usually a, a few within the group are like, actually, I feel really strongly about the side I argued for, and, and some people have a change of heart. <laughs> um, so it, um, I find it lively. I, I Perhaps the most animated group I had was a group of principals here at the museum <laughs> for a workshop that <laughs> really had um, a, a great, great rapport. Um, so I wanted to kind of wrap up, going back, um, th these are just a couple of resources and we will again give you that link, some ways you can find more information um, that could certainly be folded into the conversation about the work of art, but I wanted to go back to um, our slide thinking about um, the range of experiences presented throughout the session today um, to think about some connections, so you're welcome um, to add for those of you watching online in the question and a question and answer section um, to add comments or to go ahead and ask questions. We will um, take the last few minutes to kind of gather comments and reflections um, from those of you who are watching in the question and answer section. And of course, um, feel free to chime in about any connections you um, saw between these kind of key skills being emphasized in the Common Core Standards and um, some of the activities today. Great, so we've got some comments coming in. Um, so it looks like um, one question was just a follow-up to that activity. Um, someone was wondering, do I typically have students write down or discuss their, their, um, with their group before they begin debating? That is actually an alive on-site experience. Um, something I usually do, I'll usually provide a graphic organizer. Um, you can just fold a sheet of paper into quarters and decide kind of four key um, artist choices um, and, and they can vary depending on what your focus is um, for students to collect that in information initially and then they come together so we'll divide kind of in two circle groups and they make their game plan um, and come up with their what they feel is their strongest argument. Um, someone, there were three um, kind of pluses for the comments. Someone when noticing um, or just making note earlier in the session, someone said, I think it was in response to Angela, that they really like the technique of thinking by drawing what you see. I think students would really enjoy that technique. So it sounds like for Angela, that was something you did just intuitively as a way um, that you engage with works of art. but. Feel free to chime in um, if there's anything you want to add about that. Oh, uh, well, at PS69, every student comes into the studio with a learning journal and they draw for two to five minutes an image, a masterwork on the smart board that is the introduction to the lesson for the day, whether it's a, you know, a series of uh, you know, a long-term project that we're working on. So um, I think that um, also they, they, they share and talk to each other about their drawing. They're, la they're able to label, write down artists' names, write down different facts. So it sounds like something that's really embedded in your process. So when, when you saw the work, you're just like, oh, I will, this is, this is a way, great way to engage. Yeah, I, I never go to a museum without my book. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we have another um, comment. Um, so Andrea is commenting that she asked her students um, she asked her students to make quick color sketches of the works um, that she shows them before we even discuss the work, and it sounds similar. Um, just to help them see and look more closely before starting the discussion. 
And I think that's something interesting that in each case, um, whether it was by asking you to pause and just take a few moments um, to look closely, or in your case, drawing, that they were all kind of different means to really encourage um, people to slow down and, and look a little more closely. Uh -huh. I'd also like to add that um, last year, I took my students to the Gardner Museum because we were doing a writing project and, and they were writing stories, short stories in response to different works at the Gardner Museum and um, it was actually Sarah and, and her colleague Michelle's idea to have students sketch the works that they chose to write about and once the students brought the sketches back to the school, uh, they also had the online uh, reproductions of the works to, to compare. But it was interesting because I think going off of what um, yeah. Angela was saying, you know, students really drew what they thought were important in the pieces. So after looking at their sketches, they were able to think about what they were going to write about because the sketches really brought out what stuck out to them and what they noticed first. Mm -hmm. Even if they weren't the most artistically inclined students because in ninth grade students are very self-conscious about their, their sketching skills. Thanks, Michael. Is there anyone else that wanted to comment from our from our panel online? Um, Great. I'll put Kelly. I'll put you up on the screen. Yeah, a couple of things that um, that I thought about are uh, how important it is to have a good reproduction if you're going to work from a reproduction. Um, and and do VTS or the I think I see I wonder or or ideally how it's better to actually have the actual art object. Um, it's just it's just so much a much richer experience. And then the other thing I thought about in doing this was prior knowledge. And you know when I was taking the side of uh, the Charles Sheeler painting being anti technology, I kind of already knew that he was he thought it was beautiful, and um, and uh, so it was it was a funny. I mean, with my elementary school kids, that wouldn't be a problem. But it's like hard to do this when you have some prior knowledge um, to be very free about it. Um, that's my. Those are the two things I was thinking about. Thanks, Kelly. I think um, your comment about the original, the um, looking at original works of art resonates with one of the comments. Um, uh, someone or one of the questions someone asked. Um, whether the Met and Sabella Stewart Gardner and the other museums are doing these activities online in hangouts with children. Um, speaking for the Met, we haven't done that. Um, right at this point, we're really engaging school groups in the galleries. Um, and I think that is, as you're thinking about close reading, it's certainly something to consider while um, you might not be able to get to a museum. There are certainly layers of information thinking about materials, thinking about scale um, that came up that you might miss, um, you know, looking at a reproduction. Um, so just something to consider. And I just wanted to add, um, that's a really good point, Kelly, and it's always challenging. So the, the, the Getty hasn't done it with students yet, because um, like I said, I only work with teachers, but um, I think it is a challenge based on um, what's available for teachers, because, you know, we still have teachers that um, use overhead projectors. <laughs> Although the Getty has turned more and more to doing these incredible zoom features, so you know if I had put that image up just on the internet, I would have been able to travel all over and show um, um, highlights of the objects and, and, and like I said, zoom in to get close looking and close details, but yet there's still that challenge where a lot of teachers don't have access to the internet. Um, or a, a good connection and teachers that just still use overheads and so forth. So um, it's something to keep in mind and as you mentioned it's definitely always nice to see the objects um, at the museum. Mm -hmm. And I'll just chime in that at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum grades 3 through 12 come to the museum two or three times a year to look at the actual objects and other than that they're using uh, PowerPoint slideshows of objects that are actually not from our collection. There are much broader, more diverse, varied cultures, varied types of artwork. Um, if you've been to the Gardner Museum, it's mostly Italian Renaissance art. So they use uh, um, slides to look at artwork in the classroom, except for the 
younger students, instead of using slides, actually use posters. So they have a physical concrete object, even though it's not the authentic art object. They're looking at a physical piece. Thanks, Sarah. So we have just a few minutes left, and I wanted to be sure um, to mention our upcoming um, upcoming program. So it relates well to thinking about um, resources. The next online hangout um, for teachers will be next Tuesday, January 28th, um, from 4:30 to 5:30 p.m. And it's really Claire, going. To oh yes. What happened to our moderator? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for any technical difficulties. So I just wanted to mention um, the next um, upcoming online hangout for educators. It'll be next Tuesday. Really I think focusing. We lost our moderator. On um, free resources. Interesting. I think the pictures for us. I'm not, I'm not sure if you yeah. can hear me or not, um, but I just want to. I can. To I see you, Daniela and Claire, and yeah, but we don't have our moderator anymore. I, I could still hear Claire. I don't oh, know. I heard you. Maybe some people can hear me and some people can't. Um, what I wanted to do is just thank everybody. Hopefully, you could hear me um, for coming, and I'm passing along a link to the online survey here and hope you will fill it out and if I will also post it on the event page we'd really love to get your feedback this is a new initiative we're keen to see if this is something um, you know that is useful for you uh, that we should continue oh Angela I believe you just muted the Met Oh, you're Alan, back. You? Okay, I'm back. I will. Persevere. I could uh, not no hear problem. anybody. I don't hear anything. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna share uh, that. I ju you. somebody just muted me on the <laughs> event profile um, on the event page, so you can um, use that link to both access the PowerPoint for the session as well as respond to the survey. So wow. thank you so much for joining us. Um, Got we messed really up appreciate somehow. it. And thanks to our teachers um, for joining us as well. We really Normand. your your time um, joining us during the session today. And Sarah Eakin. Are you there?